Hi, this is Matt McKeever with Phi.ca. This is part two of the six part video series where I'm gonna be showing you exactly how I implement the burn investment strategy on my rental property in London, Ontario on Live Street. In part one, we focused on where the term burr originated from, what it stands for, and I gave you a high level understanding of how I'm implementing it. But just as a quick refresher, burr stands for buy, renovate, rent, refinance, and repeat. If you haven't watched part one and you're not familiar with what BRRRR stands for, I highly recommend you first check out part one. I'm going to be showing you exactly how I bought this property for $22,000 under asking, a neighborhood where properties are frequently now selling for above asking due to the fact they're getting into multiple offers. But before we get into the exact strategies and tactics I used to buy this property, I have another just really quick tangent alert. So I think this video is where I really started providing value for you. Uh, to me, buying a rental property is the most important step in the whole process of real estate investing. Whether you're looking to burr a property like I am on this property, or you're looking to buy a turnkey rental property or a quick flip, regardless, buying it at the right price and the right terms is how you're going to make a good deal. I know when I originally got into real estate investing, you know, I read a ton of blogs, read a bunch of books, and watched a ton of HGTV shows. And they're great for getting you really motivated and amped up about the idea of real estate investing, but rarely do they really delve into the strategies. And at best, they're probably just focused on high level strategies and they almost never get into the exact tactics that their host or their uh, main character is focusing on. And so that's a niche that I'm really hoping to fill in this video series. All right, so tangent over, let's get into how I bought this property. Having a great team is a great way to get great deals. Get a good realtor. Don't just take a referral from a friend or family member who they use that person to buy their family home. Find out, is this realtor in it for the long term? And the problem is that a lot of realtors that just sell McMansions and only deal in suburbia, they don't understand the investor mindset. They're gonna show you five to 10 properties and they expect you to buy one. I'm usually looking at five to 10 properties a week and making an offer a week, but I'm not even buying a property a month right now at this stage. So you need a realtor that's going to take the long term focus, not just someone that's transaction focused, that's worried about making this month's commission. You want a real estate agent that really understands the investor perspective, someone that's familiar with a lot of the terms. Do they know what the 1% rule is? Have they bought investment property or sold investment property before? Do they currently own investment properties? Those are the sort of things that you're going to want to ask your agent just to get a feel for, do they really understand where you're coming from? I'd highly recommend when you're looking for your own realtor that you consider reaching out to other investors you know and ask them for referrals, as well as go to bigger pockets. If they're an investor themselves, they're going to really understand the perspective more and they're going to understand that you're not going to get emotional about these properties, that you're just focused on getting the best terms. If you're curious about finding out exactly how I'm buying rental properties in London, Ontario, feel free to reach out to my realtor, Jeff Weibel. Hopefully through the magic of editing, I've thrown up all his contact information right here and feel free to ask away. Don't be afraid to have multiple great realtors. Make sure you're forward and upfront with them right from the beginning. Tell them that you're gonna be using multiple realtors, explain the situation. Essentially what you're just gonna to wanna to say is, look, I'm focused on getting the best deals. Whatever realtor can provide me uh, with access to the best deals is the realtor I'm going to use. And just make sure that they understand that if they show you a deal first, that you're going to use them for that deal. If they find out after the fact that you're using multiple realtors and they thought you were exclusive to them, they're going to get really demotivated, if not right out angry with you because they're going to think you were wasting their time or you were leading them on. So be very cognizant and be very fair to your team. Because at the end of the day, you want to build really long-term relationships with these people so that they're constantly looking out for your best interest and you're constantly looking out for their best interest. I mean, that's just how you're going to create a win-win. Simple as that. But in addition to that, tell the rest of your network that you're looking to buy. Tell them what neighborhoods. You want to build a great lead generation system so that you're constantly getting good deals in front of you. I think the best way to do that is first, build a really strong relationship with an investor-oriented real estate agent. In addition, get a bird dog if you can and let your social network know that you're out there and looking for deals. You'll be surprised about what you find. Then, what I think is the most important part of buying rental property comes into play, which is aggregating, gathering as much information as possible. And so by that, I mean, I think there's really three types of information you're going to, want to be focused on. There's property specific, there's neighborhood specific, and there's seller specific. And so property specific is really just information specific to the property. So what type of property is it? Is it a multifamily? What type of zoning does it have? Is it conforming to the current bylaws? 
Has there been recent permits pulled on it? What are the current rents on that property? Does the property cash flow? Can it cash flow? What sort of renovations does it need? Then there's neighborhood specific. And so neighborhood specific is more along the lines of what's market rents in the area? What's the high end and the low end of the rents? Kind of what are the demographics of your neighborhood? Is it trending towards retirees or young families? Are there more jobs coming to the community or jobs leaving the community? Is there plans to close or open a school? What's going on with transit? Is there any plans for rapid transit in the future? Does it already have access to rapid transit? You just need to gather all, as much information as you can about the neighborhood, become an expert on your neighborhood. Then there's seller specific information. Seller specific information is by far my favorite type of information. I think it's the most valuable information too. Really just finding out the seller's story. Why are they selling? What are their motivations? What's causing them headaches? How can you be the Advil to their problem? So that's all great in theory and those are some great strategies, but what are some actual specific tactics that you can take action on? Pull up old listings, old MLS listings. You'll be surprised about the wealth of information you can get from them. Maybe in 1990, this duplex that you're looking to buy was actually listed as a triplex. Does that mean it could be turned back into a triplex? Because if so, there's a lot of potential value there. Pull up the sales history. So in Canada, that's usually through Geo Warehouse. So they can tell you all the different prices the property has sold for over the years. Also now these days, most municipalities and cities have great zoning maps that you can access online. So you can actually pull up the address of the property you're looking at and look exactly at what the zoning is for that property. I know that's the case in London, Ontario. Cities also have their building permits online. So you can actually pull up and see what old building permits have been pulled for it. So you can see when uh, the sewer connection was last upgraded. Again, I know that's the case in London. You can look it up right here. Just literally just Google the address of the property. Just type it into Google. Odds are, if it's an income property, you're gonna find old rental listings. So it's gonna have old photos of the property as well as like details about what prices they were asking. So say that property you're looking at now that's a fourplex that has four units, they're all rented for $1,000, but you just, in your gut, it doesn't feel right. You don't think that that's what it's really worth. Maybe you could Google the address and you'll find that two years ago it was renting for $500 a unit. Now, has the market drastically changed or have they inflated the rents by getting friends or family to move in for a short period of time to try and get the best bang for their buck when they resell? That's the sort of stuff that you can stumble upon by Googling the address. As well, you can actually check on the police website as well and see has it been broken into in the past, was it used as a grow up, all that great information. And again, I know that's the case in London, we have a crime map. You want to get as much information about your property as possible, it's gonna really help you focus in and narrow in on what you need to do with this property. So for neighborhood specific information, just being aware of your neighborhood. So read the local newspapers, listen to the local uh, radio. There's still some like free newsletters that are based in local communities as well. But these days to me, like the number one neighborhood specific information, community Facebook groups. And almost every community, every municipality, every city these days does have a Facebook group. And regardless of whether people love their neighborhood or hate it, odds are they're talking about it and they're going to be talking about it on Facebook. You can quickly get a sense of the neighborhood and how involved the neighbors are in their community based on that Facebook group. All right, so that kind of covers the neighborhood specific. So let's get into seller specific. It's where you're really going to figure out how to tailor your offer or your cover letter. And so how do you get seller specific information? Well, the best way to find that out is Talk to the seller if you can. Talk to the seller's agent if you can. Talk to the current tenant and talk to the neighbors. Start up a casual, friendly conversation. Once people get started talking, they like to continue. And so I've had it happen multiple times where I'm talking to the seller directly because they happen to be the one showing me the property. And they start talking about how they owned it for 20 years. And yeah, that corner of the roof is always leaked, but it's not a big deal. And all of a sudden you can see the realtor's eyes just pop because that's not something you'd usually disclose at that stage. Either you'd already have that stated for people to know or a lot of sellers just wouldn't even bother mentioning that. But when you're in person and you've got a, a free flowing conversation and anything can come out. So don't be afraid to ask. As well, ask the tenants. Do they like the building? Do they want to continue renting? How long have they lived there? That's a great indicator of whether they like the building or not. If you ask them what's wrong with the property, they might not tell you, but if you say, have you thought about buying it? They'll go, oh no, this place is a shithole. Once ran into a situation where we found a property at Bank Repo that we started talking to the neighbor and found out that that whole street had sewer issues. 
where it was frequently being backed up and she had to spend over $5,000 to remediate the problem in her own basement. She was more than happy to share that information with us so that we wouldn't make the same mistake. And the reason she was willing to do that was just because we were friendly. I mean, being friendly is a great way to get great and free information. So, hopefully that kind of gives you a rough idea of how you're going to approach gathering and aggregating that information so that you can really tailor your offer or your cover letter to the seller. And you can't go wrong with doing a cover letter. You need to really just uh, provide the seller with your perspective and give them the background on how you determine the terms and the price that you're offering. For example, when I'm making an offer on a property that's in disrepair where I believe the seller's key motivation is they just want to get rid of their headaches and move on to the next stage of their life. They don't want to be a landlord anymore. I'll frequently list a bunch of the repairs and issues I see with the property and state that I'm willing to accept those issues as is and at the price that I'm offering. However, if the seller wanted to uh, fix it up and do X, Y, Z that I would then increase my offer. And so it's really just, you want to give them options and make it seem like you're really trying to work with them and that you're trying to create a win-win. Because at the end of the day, you are. That's the best way to get the best deal. Have the seller be excited to choose your offer versus uh, other offers that are just slapped in front of them that just say X amount and there's really no color or backstory to it. Get them engaged with you. Get them, develop a rapport with them. Give them your perspective and give them the background because if they don't know it, they're just going to make assumptions and there's a good chance that those assumptions won't be as good or as flattering as the actual truth. So if you come in at a lower price than they're asking, they might think that you're just lowballing them. Where really, you've studied this property and you know it inside and out, so you know it doesn't have a rental license, that it doesn't have an ESA or fire inspection, and that in your municipality it needs one in order to be a legal rental property. So you're going to present them with that information and just say, I'm willing to take on the hassles of that because I know that you're at the stage where you're retiring or whatever the case may be. I think there's no excuse for not having a cover letter when you're making an offer, to be honest, unless you're buying from a bank or someone that's going to be completely devoid and detached from the selling process. Get personal and share information. It's the best way to separate yourself from the rest of the pack. Because almost no one's doing this because it's a little bit of extra work and people are lazy and so don't be lazy put in that extra little effort because you're going to get tons of rewards by going just above what the average person is doing i'm not saying you have to be perfect i'm just saying you've got to be slightly better than average that's the easiest way to reap the greatest benefits with the least amount of additional effort in my opinion i'm hoping that this really gives you a strong foundation to build upon your own process and your own tactics and strategies now that you have a better understanding of the ones that I'm implementing. Or part three of this video series, we're going to be focusing on the exact renovations I did on this property, how I spent $10,000, what man hours I put into the project, and I'll just kind of outline everything so you have a much better understanding of why I did the renovations I did. In addition to that, please share this on your social media. It's the best way to pay it forward if you think I am providing you valuable content. Um, I also hope that you're going to consider taking action upon this stuff. Thanks for taking the time to watch. As always, remember, making money is a team sport. There's more than enough money out there for us to all make it. So let's go make some money, guys. Bye.